Welcome everybody to our first online lecture for the Centre of Yoga Studies. Um, as I'm sure you know, this is uh, unusual for us. We're used to doing live events, but obviously we can't do that at the moment. So we're trying something a bit new. So please bear with us through any potential technical hitches. Um, we're also recording this in the hope that we'll be able to share that afterwards. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm sure we have some people here, as this is an international audience, who know, don't know that much about the centre. So, um, Jim, if you wouldn't mind, when I hand over, just giving maybe a brief introduction to what the Centre of Yoga Studies is and what it does. Uh, my name is Martha. I'm the project coordinator for the centre, which is part of SOAS University. Um, we normally run events and we also run a summer school. So this is something that's a bit different for us. Um, I don't think there's any other housekeeping. I've, um, as I've said, please use the Slido for the Q&A. Details for that were also in the email that was sent out uh, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, other than that, I will shortly hand over to Dr. James Mallinson, who is the chair for the Center of Yoga Studies and also the principal investigator on the Hatha Yoga Project, which I'm sure many of you are familiar, doing uh, amazing work studying various Hatha Yoga texts, but also using bringing in ethnography and art history um, to shed light on some really fascinating areas of yoga history. Um, and I'm going to let um, Jim talk a little bit more about the center and what he's going to say today. So Jim, it is over to you. Thanks very much, Martha. Um, should I share my screen? Should I hit the, that button now? Is that the, oh, hang on, how do I do that? There we go. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, as you can probably tell already, I'm uh, not very used to all this tech. In fact, Martha's been giving me a crash course. So uh, anything that goes well is thanks to her and anything that goes badly is probably my fault. Um, uh, Martha's also given you a pretty good introduction to the centre. I'm not sure what more I can add. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of administrative part of SOAS. It's a way of bringing together the various different uh, scholars, students who are working on anything to do with yoga at SOAS and beyond. We've had uh, over the last few years, I think I think we started sort of 2018, we've hosted all kinds of events. Um, Martha's a coordinator, she's been excellent at doing all of that and we want to try to keep that momentum during that difficult this difficult period. So you can, uh, I think we've got a Facebook page on the SOAS website, we've got a page there as well. Uh, I think we occasionally tweet, don't we, Martha? Is that right? Um, but anyway, the Facebook and the, the SOAS website are the best places to check out what we're up to. And if today goes all right, we will probably um, do various more things like this. Um, okay, I'm going to try to talk for um, 55 minutes, an hour, something like that. And then we should have 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, and as Martha's uh, pointed out, uh, she set up this Slido thing where you can uh, you can write your own questions and then if you see someone else's question that you like the look of, you can upvote that and then we'll take the sort of most popular questions at the end uh, until we run out of time. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about today? What I, my, my talk today is based on a chapter that I've just submitted to a volume that's being edited by Gavin Flood, uh, which is on Hindu practice. And my chapter is on, it's called Hatha Yoga's Early History from Vajrayana Sexual Restraint to Universal Somatic Soteriology. Um, and so I think this paper, and I gave it in kind of shortened uh, forms at a couple of conferences over the last year or so, and it's really the sort of the third part in a trilogy of papers that I never really, uh, expected to write at the beginning of this project, which I think is a good thing because this, uh, uh, when I mentioned the project, for those of you who don't know, I've been uh, running this project, the Hatha Yoga project for four and a half years now, which looks into the, 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 the history of, of Hatha Yoga. And one of the big discoveries, which uh, an early discovery, which went in the first of the, the three papers that I'm talking about, this trilogy, um, was that the, there's a text called the Amrita Siddhi, uh, which was written probably in the 11th century. And uh, it's the, the first text to teach any of the practices and principles of Hatha Yoga. And the discovery that we made uh, early on in the project was that it was written in a, in a tantric Buddhist milieu. People had assumed previously that uh, it and that Hatha Yoga more generally was, had come out of sort of Shaiva tantric traditions. But this has put a sort of interesting spin on that. And that then sent me off into a, 
you know, into a, a, a direction of trying to work out how this could have happened. How come we get these teachings in the Amrita Siddhi that were uh, composed in a Buddhist milieu that then get taken on uh, sometimes verbatim, you know, verses get borrowed directly from the Amrita Siddhi and they're then used in later Hatha Yoga texts, which are not Buddhist. You know, uh, we can say Hindu, obviously the word Hindu wasn't used at the time, but Shaiva and Vaishnava uh, Hatha Yoga texts. And so that then uh, led me down a fascinating path that culminated in a paper that was published last year uh, that I called Kala Vanchana in the Konkan. So how, and then I can't remember the rest of it, it was rather good, i was pleased with the title, how, how did it go? How a Buddhist Hatha Yoga tradition cheated death uh, in, in India, or cheated Buddhism's demise in India. Um, and in that paper I kind of located uh, and uh, charted the transition from Buddhist Hatha Yoga traditions to Shaiva uh, and I located that in a place called Kadri in southwest India and I'll say a bit more about that later on in this talk uh, and then this so this is the the third paper of, of the trilogy uh, and what I'm going to talk about today I'm actually going to talk quite broadly about Hatha Yoga uh, towards the end I'm going to look at the the history of the usage of the term Hatha Yoga from about the 11th century to the 15th century. Well, actually, I'm going to look earlier than that at its, at its uh, predecessors um, in Tantric Buddhism. But the, 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 the second half of the lecture, I will look at how its, its usage, its scope becomes expanded uh, to basically encompass any kind of physical yoga practice. Uh, so by the by about the early 15th century, the composition of a text called the Hatha Pradipika, often known as the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, but not not uh, called that in its manuscripts, uh, that is that sort of teaches what I I sometimes call classical Hatha Yoga, and I'll say a lot more about that uh, in this talk. But from then on, basically that text defines what Hatha Yoga is, what physical yoga is, and no one really deviates from that. Uh, uh, subsequently. So I'm just going to chart the evolution of the usage of the term Hatha Yoga up to that point. Um, okay, so the methodology I'm going to use is primarily philology, especially the early stuff that when I'm looking at the Buddhist material. Uh, so it's possibly a little heavy going in places, um, but please bear with me because I think it's essential in order to bear out, you know, to, to, to draw out these, uh, these major conclusions. Um, okay, yeah, so the first part of the talk, I'm going to look at the earliest usages uh, of, of the term Hatha Yoga, which until the 12th century is found only in Buddhist works. Uh, and then, yeah, as I said, I'm going to chart it through the non-Buddhist works up into the Hatha Pradipika. So I've got some notes that I'm now looking at, which I don't normally do, but I'm using this uh, the privilege of, of talking online to be able to do that. And I realize I've actually said everything that I've put in my notes already. Okay, so I, without further ado then, I will move on to, I think we've got a first slide coming up. Um, yeah, actually, before I move on, I should say that my colleague Jason Birch, some of you will know that he, he wrote a paper, uh, it was published a long time ago now, 2011, um, which was called The Meaning of Hutter. And in that paper, you know, he looked at some of the material, you know, some of what he looked at has inspired what, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, he was the first to identify these usages of, of Hatha Yoga in Tantric Buddhist texts. I'll sometimes say Vajrayana, Vajrayana and Tantric Buddhism are basically the same thing. So if I say one or the other, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the same thing. He identified uh, six or seven texts in which the term Hatha Yoga is used. He looked at its usage. I'm going to build upon that. He concluded that, uh, he, he supposed that we might well find the term Hatha Yoga also used in Tantric Shaiva texts and sort of supposed, suggested that the usage in uh, Vajrayana was borrowed from Tantric Shaivism, um, which seemed possible at the time. But I think now, since then, what I'm going to show is that to the six, uh, seven texts that he identified, I've now found with the help of colleagues and just looking around 10 more Tantric Buddhist texts, which uh, talk about Hatha Yoga and no Shaiva texts. OK, so we only find prior to the 12th century, we only find the term Hatha Yoga used in, in Tantric Buddhist works. Um, 
And what I will do after that is I'm going to look at um, in Shiva texts where we find uh, subject matter material dealing with what elsewhere might be called Hatha Yoga, either in Tantric Buddhist texts or in the subsequent Hatha Yoga corpus, where it, Hatha Yoga means, you know, what we understand it as uh, Asana, Mudra, Kumbhaka, etc. The, the Shaiva texts do use uh, different terminology. They don't use the word Hatha Yoga and they do have particular words, which I, you know, I'm arguing supports my contention that the term originated within, uh, within Tantric Buddhism. Um, okay, so the first slide I've got here is, oh, how do I do this? Oh, there we go. I wasn't actually full screen. Oh, no. Play. Yeah, here we go. Hatha Yoga in Buddhist texts. Um, so the first slide, this is a, a, a quote from a text called the Bodhisattva Bhumi. This is, I mean, it's not, not particularly germane to my argument, but it was interesting to come across this. And I think it's likely that in some instances, uh, the, the, find, the, the usage of the term that we find in Vajrayana texts is derived from this. But the Bodhisattva Bhumi is, is very old. It's probably third century. Uh, it's part of a, a massive text called the Yoga Chara Bhumi, a sort of uh, Mahayana yoga work. Uh, and you'll see in bold there in that section it says prakriti prakriti bhadratayaiva na hatha yogena i can't actually see the rest of it because people's faces are in the way but i think it says na hatha yogena tasmin kushale pravartate and the sense of that um is that um someone who is gotrasta you'll see a couple lines above which means uh in, in a buddhist context means someone who is going to become uh, who is destined to become a bodhisattva, he or she will acquire the appropriate qualities of the bodhisattva through their natural excellence, so their kind of inborn, inborn um, goodness, their, their prakriti bhadrata. Uh, so by, it's by means of that that they acquire this quality, na hatha yogena. And here, I think hatha yoga just means by the application yoga of force, hatha. Okay, so you can't basically force yourself to get onto the bodhisattva path. It's through uh, the kind of natural qualities that you're born with. And there's something we need to bear in mind, even, even within some of the subsequent Vajrayana texts, is that sometimes it seems that Hatha Yoga just means, you know, well, especially Hatha Yogena, as we have it here, the instrumental, by means of Hatha Yoga, just means forcefully forcing something to happen. Anyway, that was interesting to come across that, but actually with hindsight. Oh yeah, I should, one point is that the editor here of the text, who's called Wagihara, a Japanese scholar, he's actually added a na that uh, is not found in the, in the manuscripts, but is supported in the Tibetan and Chinese translations. <coughs> um, but so there's some disagreement about whether uh, it can be done by forcing it or not, but that really is not, you know, not incidental to, to what we, uh, are looking at. So I will move on from there to, and here's a long list. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but these are the, the 17 texts that, uh, as I said, building on Jason's article and then uh, looking around in various other texts and with the help of colleagues, um, these are the, <coughs> excuse me, 17 uh, Vajrayana texts which mention Hatha Yoga. Uh, and you can see from their dates, uh, you know, the oldest is early 8th century, going up to about 1200, going up to the kind of period when we then start seeing Hatha Yoga appearing in uh, other non-Buddhist non texts. Um, now, the, uh, the earliest of those texts is the, 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 with this long metrical name, the Sarva Buddha Sama Yoga Dharkani Jala Sambara, uh, which is a sort of early, one of the earliest um, for foundational yogini tantras uh, and in there hatha yoga uh, nothing explicit is said about how hatha yoga might be performed uh, but in one in, in in one verse it's associated with mastering bodhicitta i.e semen uh, and that association is found in several subsequent texts um, uh, as i said in some of the subsequent texts sometimes hatha yoga just means by doing something forcefully and it's not really made clear what that is uh, but in the majority of the texts in that list, it is associated with the cultivation or the and or the restraint of bindu semen. I, sorry, I shouldn't say bindu because in these texts, the word bindu, which we find later in the Amrita Siddhi and 
a subsequent Hatha Yoga text to denote semen, which is to be controlled by the Hatha Yoga techniques. These texts don't use that word. Uh, Bindu, they will generally use bodhicitta, or they might use shukra or, or something else, some other synonym. Um, okay, then the first sort of really uh, detailed, explicit discussion we get of, of Hatha Yoga within Vajrayana is in, uh, what number are they? Number five and six on the list, the Seka Nirdesha and the Seka Nirdesha Panjika of um, two uh, excellent Buddhist scholars called Maitreya Nata, who wrote the Seka Nirdesha, and then his student Ramapala wrote the Panjika commentary on that. And so they go into some detail about Hatha Yoga. They don't actually say how it's done. I'll come on to that. But they, um, they say what it does uh, and what it means in the context of tantric Buddhist ritual. And we know a lot about these texts thanks to this uh, monumental uh, study of them that was published, I think, in 2014 by Harunaga Isaacson and Francesco Sfera. Uh, and they, um, you know, what have I, I think I've got a slide on this. Here we go. Hatha Yoga, according to Maitreya Nata and Ramapala. So, this is in the context of Tantric Buddhist sexual ritual. And you'll see on the left-hand side, uh, the, the normal order of the blisses that are experienced during, during uh, Tantric Buddhist sexual ritual. The first is Ananda, regular bliss, uh, which is, and I've got a note on this, um, which arises during foreplay. The second is Paramananda, supreme bliss, experienced during coition. The third is Sahajananda, spontaneous or natural bliss, which is experienced when semen reaches the glands of the penis. And the fourth is Viramananda, the bliss of cessation, experienced when semen falls into the consort's vagina. Okay, so that's your regular tantric sex, but some, uh, or tantric Buddhist sex, I should add, I'll come back to that because it's a different concept in Shaivism. Um, but some traditions, some lineages, they reverse the third and the fourth, as you can see there on the right hand side. So that's the, and that is deemed in some text Hatha Yoga. Now it's then not only are those two blisses reversed, but the meaning of virama, virama ananda is, um, is, is changed, is played around with because the prefix vi in Sanskrit can mean various different things. It can be almost, um, contradictory it can mean either uh sort of something the, the negative almost of something or without something but it can also mean an intensification of something uh so the scholars analyzing the hatha yoga order of blisses they say that in fact uh viramananda as opposed to being the bliss of cessation as it is in the normal order means the bliss of intensified pleasure okay and then finally it culminates in sahajananda um now the idea here is that the, the semen doesn't fall effectively. So here we have, you know, this is actually, it's an it's a unusual kind of, uh, you know, a heterodox tradition, even within tantric Buddhism, which teaches that the male partner in the sexual ritual should not ejaculate. And as I'll come on to in, in Shaivism, we don't find this idea at all. Okay, so the you know, the kind of popular Western notion of, of tantric sex is really very much a very, very obscure kind of uh, small component of, uh, of tantric practice historically. Um, and then, so, but it's not explained, it's never really explained actually within these tantric Buddhist traditions how this is accomplished. Um, we do get a, a more specific definition here, which Jason translated in his article, and I've, this is my translation here. Uh, we can read out the, well, might as well read out the whole thing, actually. Now, Hatha Yoga is explained. In this system, uh, when the undying moment does not arise, i.e. when you don't achieve the, you know, the, the, the particular elevated state of mind that you're trying to through uh, the ritual, because the, if, if that doesn't happen because the breath is unrestrained, even when the image is seen by means of withdrawal, pratyahara, and the other auxiliaries of yoga, i.e. dhyana, pranayama, dharana, anusmriti, and samadhi, those are the six angas in the usual uh, kala chakra system. Yeah, sorry, this is Pundarika's commentary on the Lagu Kala Chakra Tantra, so it's written, uh, we can date it pretty precisely to around 10.30. Um, 
I, well, I say we, that, that's uh, with the, the help of Francesca Sfera, who's been very helpful with me in, on, in this, this work. <clears throat> All the dates in that previous slide were pretty much corrected by either by him or by Peter Sante. Um, now, yeah, so then if, if, you, if you can't make it work normally, uh, then, having forcefully, Hartena made the breath flow in the central channel through the practice of nada, which is about to be explained, although it doesn't actually get explained in much clarity, I'm afraid, the yogi should attain the undying moment by non-vibration through restraining the drops of bodhicitta, i.e. semen, in the vajra, i.e. the penis, when it is in the lotus of wisdom, i.e. the vagina. That is hatha yoga. Okay, so... To summarize, again, it's not said exactly how you do this, but to summarize, in uh, Tantric Buddhist traditions, Hatha Yoga means uh, the restraint of ejaculation during uh, Tantric sexual ritual. Um, it's also, yeah, I should add, because it sort of then comes into something we'll look at later on, it's also uh, always seen pretty much always, most traditions reject it completely, so you shouldn't do it, so it's bad. I mean, generally in Tantric Buddhism, the whole notion of hutta, of forcing, of forcing anything to happen is seen as bad. Things should be sahaja, it's opposite, There's, they should be natural. Uh, and even those traditions which do advocate it, like here, like we see in the Vimala Prabha, it should only be done as a kind of method of, of last resort. It's not, you know, it's not the, the way that one should go about one's practice from, from scratch. Um, yeah, and one last thing I'll add before I move on is that I think, I suspect, and we can, I mean, this is only an inference, and I don't think it can ever really be proven. I suppose we might one day discover a, a text which proves it, but I think that the, the actual practical method of doing this, uh, and it is supported by um, texts in Tibetan and also continued practice amongst Tibetan Tantric Buddhist practitioners, I think the practice uh, that's used to accomplish this is what's called Vajroli Mudra in subsequent uh, non-Buddhist Hatha Yoga texts. Um, I've written a bit about this elsewhere, I think in that Kala Vanchana in the Konkan article. Vajroli itself actually means the Vajra lineage, uh, so it means the lineage of Tantric Buddhism, so it's pretty clear that you know Vajroli Mudra, this technique of urethral suction which is then meant to uh, give um, mastery of the ejaculatory impulse is understood within the Hatha Yoga tradition to have derived from uh, Tantric Buddhism. Okay, so that's, um, you know, that, uh, those are the, yeah, the, the, that's what I wanted to say about Hatha Yoga within Tantric Buddhism. And then I will repeat now that we don't find the term used in Tantric Shaivism. What I'm going to look at now, uh, the, you know, the few areas where we might expect to see it, knowing what it means. So I'm going to look firstly at uh, the this same concept, this same idea. Have I got another slide? Yeah. The same idea of um, the, the, the referent of Hatha Yoga in Tantric Buddhism being this, uh, you know, restraint of, of orgasm by the male partner in Tantric, in, in sexual ritual. Uh, now, as I mentioned, this is actually surprisingly rare within tantric shivas and in fact it almost completely disappears by the time of abu Navagupta, it's gone no one's really doing this anymore what some people did do uh and we have texts which go quite a long way back i think i've got a slide on this here yeah so there's a, a practice called the asi dhara vrata which basically means the knife or the uh, you know, the, the razor's edge penance the asi dhara the edge of the asi the, the razor or the blade the vrata the observance penance um, and it's mentioned way back, so the Lankavatara Sutra, I think that's in that first, second century, and then Raghu Vansh of Kalidasa. Uh, and then we see, you see the, the texts in bold, those are, those are Shaiva texts. Uh, and also it's sort of famously, I mean, the, the idea of it has persisted within the Indian tradition. And I think the most famous practitioner of it was uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and when you practice this Asidhara, although he didn't use the term, I should add, when you practice it, you, it involves a, a couple lying together, a male and female couple lying together and not giving in to sexual temptation. At least that's how Gandhi practiced it. That's how it's understood in most texts up to, we get, a, we get quite a, a quite explicit uh, description of it in the Brahma Yamala. Um, 
which the, the, and, and the Brahm, in the Brahma Yamla, um, it uh, it's actually more you know involves actual intercourse and 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 sexual practice, but restraint of ejaculation. And so this is the only place we really get an actual term for that idea or that the the, the practice of, of restraining the sexual impulse or the sex of uh, of, of orgasm. And there it's called abhagraha. Okay. So no mention of hatha or hatha yoga in any of these contexts. So that's all we really have in the way of uh, similar concepts of of, uh, of, of um, sexual practice or hatha uh, vajrayana style hatha yoga within tantric Shaivism. And if we look forward, okay, and I think the next slide is yeah. So this is a term I I occasionally use of classical hatha yoga. Uh, by which I mean Hatha Yoga as it was formulated in the Hatha Pradipika, um, which I date probably to around 1400, so certainly early 15th century. Uh, and there it's, Hatha Yoga is defined, or the, the stages of practice in it, the Abhyasa Nukrama, uh, is, is, is defined as Asana, Kumbhaka, uh, and then Mudra, and then Nada Anusandhana. So asana posture, kumbhaka, the various different methods of breath retention, uh, mudra, various different methods of manipulating the vital energies, and then nada nusandhana, so um, concentration on the, the inner sound. Now, those practices don't really get, um, get much of a look in in tantric Shaivism. In fact, and particularly the sort of like the Kashmiri Shaiva exegetes Abhinava Gupta and the, the, the other uh, scholars of that tradition they're quite anti such any any notion of of yoga full stop and particularly kind of physical or tough practices um but where we do get mentions of of, of such practices um it there's one term we do find occasionally being used and so here i have a list of five texts this is actually i owe thanks to um Somde vasudeva for um for uh telling me about these texts he, we had a workshop a couple of years ago and he kindly he gave a little talk about this and so these shiva texts use the term kashta yoga meaning forced or or painful yoga um now the uh chitta santosha trimshika of naga and the devi dvardha shatika give no indication of, of what it might mean uh, the tantra sadhuhava and I think I've got this on a slide coming up, that identifies mudra, mandala, mantra. Uh, here, let's, we can have a look at this, actually. Uh, so I won't read out the whole passage, but the first couple of lines there, mudra, mandala, mantraishcha, kashta yoga is tatha parahi, recha kahi, pura kar, dhyanahi, sopaya, bahubhihi, priye. And then it carries on. I've, I've stopped mid-sentence, but it's a long sentence. Um, but basically it's talking about these kashta, these difficult, hard methods of, of yoga, uh, which include mudra, mandala, mantra, uh, and then inhalation, exhalation, and various and uh, various different techniques of meditation. Um, and then at the end it said, tam tathaivam varahe grihitam, is that, that is, in this way, is, is taken up, is uh, practiced, basically understood, by manda buddhi, people, manda buddhi bihi, people with uh, dim minds, you know, it's being, it's being, uh, being censured, this type of practice. Um, and then, what else, yeah, I, in, if we go back to the list before, in, um, actually, Shiva Upadhyaya, in his commentary on the Vigana Bhairava, he's the only one who doesn't completely reject uh, this kashta yoga, these forced methods of yoga, which um, seem to, and I think he equates it uh, with pranayama in particular, which kind of matches what we saw uh, in the Tantra Sadbhava. Uh, and yeah, he, he associates with pranayama, but he, yeah, sorry, he says that um, it can have some efficacy. It is, it is useful, but again, he kind of says, it, says it's a secondary method and you shouldn't really do it, but if you have to, it does work. Um, Abhinava Gupta, uh, in his commentary in the Bhagavad Gita, when he um, mentions Kashta Yoga, he doesn't actually say what it is. Um, but elsewhere, uh, for example, in the Tantra Loka, he criticizes each of the eight Angas of Patanjali Yoga in turn, and he singles out Pranayama for special censure because it hurts the body. And so that suggests that it's probably Pranayama that he has in mind uh, here when he contrasts Kashta Yoga 
uh, with the easy attainment of Brahman through simple meditative yoga. And then similarly, although he doesn't use the term Kashta Yoga, but I think supporting this idea, uh, Kshema Raja in his Pratyabhigya Hridaya, he talks about an easy method of yoga. You see at the end of that quote, Sukho, we're talking, looking at the very bottom of the page, a Sukhopaya, uh, an easy method, um, which is easy because it has got rid of, it doesn't include the systems of restraint, uh, the Yantra Na Tantra, um, uh, all, all, this, all the systems of restraint, so must, uh, uh, such as pranayama, mudra, and bandha. Okay, so within, within uh, tantric Shaivism, these methods that we might that later on become associated closely with hatha yoga, they are uh, generally rejected for being painful and unpleasant, and when they are given a generic term, they're called uh, kashta yoga. Okay. Okay. So that basically concludes. You know, so, so my, you know, what I'm, the, the main point I'm trying to make here is that I'm now convinced uh, that the term hatha yoga, uh, as applied to, well, I, well, I should show. Now I will show you the process whereby it became applied to uh, physical yoga, understood more broadly, but. Um, I'm convinced that it originated within Buddhist tantric traditions. And, and so the evidence is there that there are 17 texts, Buddhist texts, which talk about it and no Shaiva ones. And when the Shaiva ones talk about similar things, they use different terms. Okay. So now I will move on to, I can't remember what my next slide is. Yeah. So now I will move on to the process of how um, the term Hatha yoga came to be used uh, as a kind of coverall term for all physical yoga practice. Um, so the first text to teach in any detail uh, the practices which came to be classified as Hatha Yoga in the subsequent Hatha Corpus, as I mentioned earlier, is the circa 11th century Amrita Siddhi. I think I have a slide. Oh, there we go. So that's the old, that's the 12th century manuscript of the text, or probably 12th century manuscript of the text that we have. Um, now, as I said, in the first of my, this sort of trio, triad of, of papers, I showed how the Amrita Siddhi was composed in a Vajrayana milieu, but I should add that it's unorthodox insofar as it rejects sexual ritual. So unlike all these other texts that I've been talking about, the Amrita Siddhi teaches a yoga for celibate ascetics. It rejects sexual ritual. It kind of, um, the yoga practice that it teaches, which I've talked at length, uh, talked about at length elsewhere, but that uh, is very much an internal, you know, it's a, it doesn't as it doesn't involve sexual ritual but it kind of does the same things uh, that are referred to as hatha yoga in those other vajrayana texts so it's used to make the breath go into the central channel and therefore prevent bindu semen from from flowing downwards um, it doesn't use the name hatha yoga for its method uh, its method has three core techniques mahamudra mahabandha and mahaveda uh, which, as I shall talk about in a bit, subsequently get uh, categorized as mudras uh, in classical Hatha Yoga. Uh, and they're all, you know, they're a, a system of three methods which use together uh, lock the breath in the abdomen and then propel it up the central channel. Now, the first non Buddhist text to use the term Hatha Yoga to denote a specific system of yoga is the Amarauga Prabodha. Um, and that's a Nath Shaiva work, okay, so from the, the, the Nath tradition of yogis. Uh, and it identifies as Hatha Yoga the methods taught in the Amrita Siddhi. So it teaches those three in a much shorter, it's only in a, a few verses, but it's, it's the exact same three practices. Some of the verses it borrows di directly from the Amrita Siddhi. It teaches those three practices as Hatha Yoga. It calls them Hatha Yoga because it gives a, a hierarchy of four different types of yoga practice. Um, uh, it has mantra, laya, we're going upwards here. Hatha is the the, the second from the top and then Raja Yoga. Um, now, we know that the author of the Amaragra Prabodha knew the Amrita Siddhi because he takes verses directly from it. And he would also known of the uh, Vajrayana concept of Hatha Yoga because as I've shown in this Kala Vanchana in the Konkan paper, and I've got a, a couple of slides that I'll just, just show you to kind of give you some 
visual context for this. Um, but as I showed in that paper, this transition and the composition of the Amaraga Praboda uh, very likely happened in a place called Kadri in southwest India. Now, the, uh, the, the Tantric Buddhist cult that flourished at Kadri, we know from various sources, um, uh, was, was based upon or um, uh, the, 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 well, at least the, the, the cult of the early Tantric Buddhist text, the Guhya Samaja, flourished there. And that text was in the list I showed you earlier, which talked about Hatha Yoga. So the author of the Amrita Siddhi, of the Amaraga Praboda, not only um, did he know the Amrita Siddhi, but he also knew about this Buddhist concept of, of Hatha Yoga. So I think he took these two and, and, and put them together. Now, I think I've got a few slides, which uh, just to show you, give you some visual background uh, or visual reference. There's, there's Kadri, um, in now, in, now it's a sort of part of the city of Mangalore. Uh, the temple there, which is the central shrine is now, now uh, dedicated to a form of Shiva, but in the, to the sides, we've got these uh, tantric Buddhist, beautiful tantric Buddhist bronzes dating to the 11th century. Um, so the evidence, clear evidence of Tantric Buddhist practice there from the 11th century and, and we've got textual sources which show us that there was uh, Vajrayana practice there before the 11th century. Uh, on the other side of the central shrine we've got these um, Tantric Buddhist images as well of Lokeshwara or Avalokiteshwara who's now worshipped as, as Vishnu and then the, uh, with his back to us is, is the Buddha who's now worshipped as Vyasa. Uh, and then up the hill from the temple we've got the, um, the Anat monastery and I what if various things in my Carla Vanchan and the Konkan paper um, I used to show to, to chart the transition but I think here we see quite clearly in the iconography this is an old image of Matsyendra Nata the first human guru of the Nats who is the kind of central object of the cult at Kadri uh, this one's now in the uh, Mangalore Museum presumably because it got broken as we can see uh, but then that's that's the one that's there now uh, you can see that the iconography is pretty similar to um, Lokeshwara, but what, what's really key, I'll go back to Lokeshwara, uh, and, and I've written a lot about this in the, in the Karla Vanshana paper, so if you're interested, look more, but um, there are a lot of parallels between Matsyendra and Avalokiteshwara. But if you look here on the top, can I do, oh, I can do this, can I? Uh, on the top of his, on his Jatamukuta, his crown of dreadlocks, he's got this cosmic Buddha of Amitabha, uh, and we see also on these Matsyendra images, you can't really see very clearly there, but I've got a close up. That's the one from Lokeshwara. This is the one on, on the Matsyendra currently in place next to Jackie Hargreaves who got that picture for me. Um, and this is unique in that we don't know of any other non-Buddhist, uh, Murtis, non-Buddhist images in India that have uh, a sort of anthropomorphic form on, on the head like this. So I think here we kind of see in, uh, in material form the um, transition from Tantric Buddhism to Tantric Shaivism there at Kadri, which is also where the, uh, as I said, the Amaraga Praboda was written. Uh, and there you can see the two side by side, Lokeshwara and Matsyendra. Okay, a little time. No, not too bad, okay. So, um, okay, we've got the Amrata, we've got the Amrata Siddhi, which teaches the um, text of Hatha Yoga, I mean, sorry, the, the principles and practices of Hatha Yoga without calling them Hatha Yoga. Then we have the Amarauga Prabhoda. As you can see, all those dates, in fact, the Hatha Pradipika one should probably have a question mark by it as well. So they're all a bit, bit, bit sketchy, but, um, you know, I'm pretty confident within a hundred years or so. Uh, then the next, so these are the texts which teach Hatha Yoga, okay, prior to the Hatha Pradipika. We get a couple of other texts, and I'll say more about this, which mention it. Um, but these are the only ones which actually give you some idea of, of, of what it might be. Uh, and of course, the Amrita City doesn't actually, probably shouldn't really be in the list because it doesn't use the term Hatha Yoga. Uh, but you've got the Datta Treya Yoga Shastra, which is a Vaishnava text, the Shiva Sangita, which is from the Shaiva Tantric uh, Sri Vidya tradition, and then the Hatha Pradipika, which is fairly uh, sort of ecumenical, non-sectarian, although I'm more and more convinced that it was produced within a milieu, uh, a Vera Shaiva milieu, okay, partly because of the mention of Alama Prabhu. Uh, one day I'll get around to writing that up, but I've got a lot of notes on that. Um, 
but if we look now what's my next slide oh yeah i've got so the definitions of of hatha yoga um that we have uh i don't have to look at my bit of paper anymore okay so the these are the definitions so they're not like definitions i was wondering about using that word it's not strictly true i mean here in the amaraga Prabodha, it is really definitions um because we've got you can see there the first one yes oh sorry that's uh should say hataha saha i've i've used the uh south indian orthography um yastu prabhanjana vidhana rato hataha saha so uh hata is that which is um focused upon the arrangement the management vidhana of the breath prabhanjana and then there's another definition of it within the text um uh, hatha is occasionally hatopi dvividha kwapi vayu bindu nishevana. So it's sometimes um, said to be of two kinds, depending on whether uh, one uses vayu, the breath, or bindu. Okay. Um, so that's all it says in terms of trying to define it, define hatha. But the, it's very clear that the three practices which constitute hatha yoga are the Mahamudra, the Mahabandha, and the Mahaveda, uh, which are taught in the Amrita Siddhi. Okay, then the next definition we'll look at is that in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Uh, and the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, I, it doesn't actually give a definition. So here I've just sort of summarized. Uh, it introduces Ashtanga Yoga, um, but it, so somewhat confusingly, I'm not completely clear whether one, because the Ashtanga Yoga is introduced within the Hatha Yoga section. So it's not clear whether the author understood Ashtanga Yoga to be one variety of Hatha. And then he, he certainly says that, you know, you, by means of Ashtanga Yoga, Siddhas such as Yagya Valkya attained liberation. Okay. But then he later on, he says, but there's a kind of alternative method, which has the same results that was practiced by Kapila and other Siddhas. And that alternative method is these nine, uh, in, it includes just these nine techniques called mudras, of which, and I'll say a bit more about this, uh, included in, in which are the, the three techniques of the Amrita Siddhi and Amaraga Prabodha. Okay, and then finally, uh, we've, had, we've got this definition which we looked at earlier. Okay, the, the, the classical def the, the definition of classical Hatha Yoga we find in the Hatha Pradipika, Asana, Kumbhaka, Mudra, and Nadana, Sandhana. Now, bearing that in mind, uh, if we take that, the, the, the Hatha Pradipika's definition of um, Hatha Yoga, we can then actually look backwards before it and say that all the texts in that list that I've given you there, that they all taught um, uh, Hatha Yoga, okay? Because they, they all taught, they all teach uh, some or all, probably not all, but they all teach some of the practices classified as the stages of practice of Hatha Yoga in the Hatha Pradipika. Okay, so you may think, and it's, you know, so the, the name Hatha, uh, Hatha Yoga didn't catch on, didn't sort of spread like wildfire straight away. And in fact, it didn't, ca didn't fully catch on ever. You know, there, there are still plenty of texts written after the Hatha Pradipika, which teach physical yoga, but don't really like to use the word Hatha. For example, a lot of the, um, the texts that then become classified as Yoga Upanishads, which were put together in the 17th, 18th century, uh, very few of those in fact only the yoga tattva upanishad i think which um basically draws its entire content from the dattatreya yoga shastra that's the only one that uses the the, the term hatha yoga that's just an example um but if we understand hatha yoga to mean uh those practices then yeah we can classify all these these texts as kind of you know hatha yogic texts uh now this next slide is somewhat daunting don't worry too much about it but i i, I made that myself i made this table a couple of years ago a year ago i've been adding to it to try to make sense of what's going on uh, within all these different texts now if you look at you only really need to look here at the first five which again are those texts um so these ones the texts which teach hatha yoga okay these are all prior to the hatha pradipika or include or maybe similar period in this whole table but these five Okay, and I just sort of the point of this is just to show you how they really do form a coherent and distinct group. Okay, 
They're the only ones that teach Hatha Yoga in any detail. Actually, that's not strictly true. The Shiva Yoga Padipika at the bottom does, but that's probably pretty late. They are also the only ones that teach Mahabandha, Mahaveda, and Mahamudra. Okay. They're also, I think I should, yeah, here, they're also the only ones, actually, with the exception of the Turu Mantra, which is a Tamil outlier, but they're the only ones that teach the succession of four stages of yoga practice. Um, so the, uh, what is it, um, Arambha, Ghatta, Parichaya, and Nishpati. And they're also the only ones that teach Vajroli, which again, I think is significant to show that they have, you know, they, they're in a, a practice or a even maybe not a practice tradition, it could just be a textual tradition as well, but they're coming out of this uh, tantric Buddhist, um, you know, the, the, the tantric Buddhist origins of, of Hatha Yoga. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to look in turn. So the, how are we doing? Yeah, we got, we were all right. I think I should be done in 10, 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to look now at the three, you know, particularly physical methods of, of Hatha Yoga and, sh and look at their, their categorization, their, um, their teaching within, within these texts. I'm going to look first at Mudra. Now the, there are, by the time of the Hatha Pradipika, I probably should have made this clear. I could have, I, I thought for reasons of time, I haven't gone into more detail here. Um, but this is, this is the list of 10 mudras that we get in the Shiva Sanghita and the Hatha Pradipika. Uh, the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra has the same 10 except for number eight. It doesn't have Shakti Chalani mudra. But the point I want to make here, there's a couple of points I want to make, is that if we're looking at this list, a, it's clear that it's, um, you know, we're moving into the realms of scholasticism to some extent. We're moving away, I think, from a really close relationship to the practice, to some extent, in that the four, five, and six, Jalandra Bandha, Uyana Bandha, and Mula Bandha, they are used, well, certainly Mula Bandha and Jalandra Bandha are used in number two, in Mahabandha, because okay, so it doesn't really make sense to have six different, these six different techniques. You can explain, you know, there's, there's, there's unnecessary overlaps. And this is because, so in the first text that groups them together as mudras, that's the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Now I think the author of that text was drawing on uh, both the Amrita Siddhi or the Amaraga Prabodha actually. He was probably looking at Amaraga Prabodha rather than the Amrita Siddhi. But he's also, I think, looking at, uh, there's a, sort of northern Deccani uh, yoga tradition represented in the Gyaneshwari and the Goraksha Shataka, which teaches the Jalandra Bandha, Uddiyana Bandha, Mula Bandha. So he's bringing those together. Um, he's also bringing in Viparita Karani, so the in, inversion, uh, and Kechari, and then, of course, Vajroli, which I've mentioned various times. Now, the other point I want to make is that um, well, actually, just building on that or, or clarifying that further, there are some texts. So, for example, the Amrita Siddhi and the Goraksha Shataka, very early Hatha Yoga texts, neither of which actually use the term Hatha Yoga, but they are, um, you know, they're unusual in that they teach a, a nice, coherent yoga method and they don't seem to be too derivative. You know, they're not drawing, particularly the Amrita Siddhi, they're not drawing on um, other traditions, other teachings on, on yoga. Whereas subsequently these texts become, you know, very eclectic. They're taking bits from here and there, and it doesn't always gel together that well. Um, yeah, but the other point I want to make is that from looking at this list, so as I mentioned, four, five, and six are taught in a North Ekani, um, Nart Shaiva tradition. Okay, so I, you know, I'm not. What I'm not trying to say is that all that Hatha Yoga basically came from Buddhists completely. I think certainly as it evolved, as physical yoga practice gets categorized over the course of the 11th to 15th centuries, we see these, um, these uh, you know, the, the, the scholars compiling these texts, drawing from various different traditions, including Shaiva traditions, possibly Jain traditions. I'll say a bit about that in a second. And, and diff different types of, of tantric Shaiva traditions and also Vaishnava traditions, which I'll come on to, I think, at, at the end. Uh, yeah, on that note, and I'm not going to say more about them, but the Shakti Chalani and Kechari, so Shakti Chalani Mudra is also uh, first taught in the Goraksha 
Shataka, so a, a Nart Shaiva text, whereas and the Kechari uh, teachings, certainly in the um, Hatha Pradipika, are taken from the Kechari Vidya, which is another uh, Paschimamnaya Tantric Shaiva kind of Nart related text. Okay, and we and yeah, another point I should make is that we have no no evidence for any of these practices within Tantric Buddhism within Vajrayana. Um, so not uh, uh, no evidence for Viparita Karani. Shakti Chalani and Ketri within uh, Vajrayana. Um, I'm going to just look here specifically at focus on inversions, headstands, and just say again, you know, show how they uh, appeared around this period with the first evidence we get of headstands. We get this, um, there's the, the famous story of the Nat Yogi uh, Dharam Nat, Dhino Dhar, there in, in the Ran of Kutch. I won't say much, but um, that's the mountain he uh, is said to have lived on and stood on his head for 12 years. Here's a, uh, a recent, a current um, depiction of that, of the, the story of Dharam Nath in which um, through the power of his, his tapas through doing this headstand, uh, he's meant to have created the run of Kutch. If I go back there, you can't really see it there, but there's a kind of the salt flats around there. And uh, that's meant to have been created by the power of his tapas burning up, up the sea but seismographic records, even though they're pretty sketchy, you can't be really very, very confident, they suggest that it, the, the run of Kutch was created around the 12th century, okay, which so I think we can perhaps connect those two events. Uh, now, similarly, uh, in a place called Patan, not far away, uh, we find the first textual descriptions of um, inverted postures as part of yoga in Hemachandra's Yoga Shastra, because he resided at the royal court in Patan, and you see here, he mentions the Duryodhana pose, which is like a headstand, and then also, uh, and he gives it the alternative name, Kapali Karana, and then also the, the Danda Padmasana, which is an in, inverted uh, lotus position. Um, and then finally, just of these three things, just to, so my point here is that, uh, well, yeah, I'll just, uh, well, uh, Du Bois, uh, we've got this decade of Du Bois, which I talked about a lot, which was a you know a exciting discovery as part of my, research project is the first visual material evidence of headstands. Um, yeah, here they are. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here is that, firstly, that uh, headstands, inverted postures, uh, well, headstands, because we do have much older evidence of people hanging upside down from trees as a kind of form of tapas, but the, the concept of of balancing on your head first appears in these three places and then fairly quickly finds itself within the, the Hatha Yoga corpus. There you see this Dunda Padmasana perhaps. The, it's not quite a lotus posture, is it? But it's pretty close and inverted position. Uh, and there's a sort of regular headstand. Okay, so there's that. And and so both, so Dharam Nath was a yogi of the, uh, you know, affiliated with the Nath tradition. Here, if we go back uh, here in the gate, the lower line of um, of statues on this gate, there's 12 of them in all. Uh, they're all uh, famous, you know, the Nath yogis. Meanwhile, the, the, the building of the gate was patronized by a couple of famous Jain merchants. Um, they're called Gejpal and, gosh, I can't remember the other one's name now. Anyway, they were, they were Jains, and of course, Hema Chandra, we got there, Hema Chandra, he was a Jain scholar, but patronized sometimes by Shaivas as well. So it seems anyway that the headstand was coming out of perhaps an ascetic Shaiva Jain tradition. Not, not but there, I have come across one, one reference to standing on your head in, um, it's in the Kala Chakra Tantra, in fact, Lagu Kala Chakra Tantra, uh, in which uh, it's said to be something you should do when you've got an excess of kapha. It's not kind of used as part of yoga, but it does. Uh, they do actually talk about doing headstands, interestingly enough. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's it's used as a yogic method derives from Vajrayana. Okay, so go forward through those again. Yeah, and I'll just we're going to wrap up fairly quickly. Leave some time for a few questions. I'm surprisingly well timed. Um, Kumbhaka, just look at this list of the. So the eight different methods of uh, breath control, I suppose we should call it, because kumbhaka really means breath retention, but the, the differences in the methods are all in terms of um, inhalation and exhalation. These are the eight that are taught in the Hatra Pradipika. 
Now, the first four are taken from the Goraksha Shataka, which I mentioned earlier. is also the first text to teach the Shakti Chalani Mudra and also Jalandra and Uddiyana and uh, Mula Bandha. Okay, so again, coming from a, a tantric Shaiva source or a Nath source. And then the, the, the second four, Sit, Sitkari, Brahmari, Murcha and Plavani, we, they, they first appear as far at the moment. We don't know, we know of no textual uh, precedence for them. So they first appear in the Hatra Pradipika. And then finally, nearly done here, Asana. <clears throat> um, so the Hatra Pradipika teaches 15 asanas, of which I think it's not many, it's maybe six now. I'm, I sort of change what I classify as a, as a complex or non-seated posture, but five or six are sort of not seated postures. But the two oldest ones, the oldest ones for which we have any uh, evidence, are the Mayurasana, well, there's a typo there, should be Vimanarchana Kalpa Patla 96, which is a text that probably dates the 10th or 11th century. Uh, it's then borrowed from in various texts until the, the, the same verse. Well, then it, it, it goes through various Vaishnava tantras until it appears in the Vasishta Sangita, from which it is then um, taken to, to be used in the Hatha Pradipika. Having been told, this, here, it's, here the description is in prose, but all subsequent descriptions draw from this one, but they put it into verse. Um, and then similarly, although it's not in the Vimana Archana Kalpa, but in, the, in a, a Panchavaratra, so that the Vimana Archana Kalpa is from a Vaishnava tradition known as Vaikhanasas. The Aho Buddhya Sanghita is from a Vaishnava tradition, the Pancharatrika Tantric Vaishnava tradition, and that's the first text that we know of to teach Kukutasana, okay, which then again similarly winds it ends up, we see we can sort of trace it through a couple of other. Vaishnava Sanghitas, then into the Vasishta Sanghita, and then into the Hatha Pradipika's Asana tradition. Okay, so that's more or less it, I think. So the point there I wanted to make again, you know, just to show that although I have, you know, a big discovery of our project has been that the early textual codification of Hatha Yoga uh, and its name, indeed, as I've shown here, um, came from tantric buddhist traditions as the the remit of the term expanded to include uh, a wide range of physical methods it drew in methods from various different traditions uh, none of which were also tantric buddhist so we've got these vaishnava possibly jain and various different shaiva lineages that uh, contributed physical methods of yoga to to swatmarama's classical Hatha Yoga. Thank you very much. Um, now I, I'm not quite sure what I do now about answering the questions. Um, so I'm I'm going to come back in and uh, relay some questions from our side. We've had a few. Um, I'm sorry, Jim, because it's live. Uh, not live. You don't get to hear. What I'm sure would be a round of applause and thank you <laughs> for that lecture. So you'll just have to imagine that. Um, so we have had a couple of questions on Slido. Um, we have um, one that's around, uh, there's a question around energy and Bindu, which is slightly unclear. So if the, whoever wrote that wouldn't mind just having a quick check over of that um, and just to clarify it, it's not 100% clear what the question is. But in the meantime, we have another one. Um, so the question is, I think I read in Jim's earlier papers that the Hatha Pradipika was a coup for the nut in their appropriation of the yoga of traditions like the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Do you now think that it's not a nat appropriation, but a Vera Shaiva one? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm always in, often embarrassed, not always, but often embarrassed when I, well, not embarrassed, but, you know, I think, well, I think, you know, always, always, if, if, if you're following my work, definitely go on what I've said most recently, because it's, I mean, it, you know, I'm changing my mind about things all the time, which is exciting, but I guess, uh, be confusing if you try to read earlier things yeah i think i so when i first study started um studying this material you know as a sort of young young thruster of a scholar wanted to fight against the orthodoxy the received understanding which i think i mean i, I still stand by it to a great extent but um interestingly my recent work has kind of taken me back uh, around and made me have to re 
rephrase those ideas i.e you know i was not i could see that this notion that all that hatha yoga was exclusively a domain of the nart um tradition was was wrong so i pushed back against that in particular by you know promoting the dattatreya yoga shastra uh, i think i probably went too far in that to some extent and i think i'm more and more convinced especially as you know looking at these tantric buddhist traditions which clearly morphed into um nath shaiva traditions and made a, a key foundational contribution to the history of hatha yoga so the, the you know the nath's role is is extremely important um but to go to look at the hatha pratipika itself yes i think um even though it mentions the great siddhas and includes lots of siddhas from nath traditions it includes various others including alama prabhu okay who was the main you know one of the most important teachers in the tradition that subsequently came to be known as as vera shivas um and the hatha pradipika also doesn't bang any kind of sectarian drum I, we we don't see anything in it that makes us think that it is specifically a nath text it's clearly shiva um but i think we can't from the mention of the siddhas within it uh, i don't think we can then instantly draw the conclusion that it's a nath text um and secondly there are see this is what i need to write up and i haven't written it up properly yet but i've got extensive notes on this the uh there are some interesting parallels between it and a text um that uh, someone called Jamal Jones Dr Jamal Jones who's at where is he University of Davis in California he did his phd thesis on this text called the navanata charitramu which is uh the, the story of the deeds of the nine nats and that was written in Sri Shailam in Andhra Pradesh in around 1400 now what's interesting about that in relation to the hatha pradipika is that it was written by a a vera shaiva scholar uh but it's all about the nine nats so the, the so i think what we what we have to remember is that it, to a great extent the nine nats and we see this particularly in tamil nadu as well later on they uh they, you know they acquire a, a status of of divinity kind of even where the sect of the nats where the living tradition doesn't exist or doesn't flourish so there's no evidence really that in south india that the, the nat tradition has ever um flourished or in, in tamil nadu meanwhile there are places where they worship these 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 nine nats so i think we one can happily dissociate uh the a mention of the nine nats from an existence of a living nat tradition and then just one one more point uh i th- i think the 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 mention of alama prabhu is extremely important in that and i've asked scholars who are more specialist in this field than i am we really don't get any mention of him anywhere north of you know north of the deccan at all ever you know he doesn't he doesn't kind of his influence doesn't go beyond there so i think we can use that to point yeah sorry i, I will carry on that uh we can use that and also this idea in the hatha pradipika of raja yoga the way that's really um um pushed through this we find the same thing in the navanata charitramu and what seems to be going on and i think this is key this is something i'm going to be writing up um over the next few months a key to the production of a lot of these texts the hatha yoga texts i think they were they were written uh within monastic traditions at a time when the monasteries were becoming extremely important and also when their the heads of the monasteries were beginning to function like kings okay and this is taught in the navanata charitramu it's made very explicit that the best kind of ruler is the ascetic king okay matsyendra nata is 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 valorized as an, as an ascetic king uh, and we get the same notion within these hatha yoga texts you know hatha yoga is always subordinated or in the hatha pradipika to some extent equated with uh, raja yoga which not only is raja yoga um you know equated with the the final state of of the final goal of yoga as samadhi but it's also often understood as a position of or a state of being able to you know being a king and a yogi at the same time okay so because we get these i think we get the, the i'm i'm convinced that the parallels between even though they're very different texts 
the Navanata Charitramu and the Hatra Pradipika. And there are sim some similarities in, in linguistic terminology as well, because Telugu, especially scholarly Telugu, can be very close to Sanskrit. I think they were composed in the same milieu, i.e. within a, a proto Virashaiva milieu, because they weren't calling themselves Virashaivas at that point. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a very long answer to a short question. But, um, I hope that made some sense. And so yeah, I'll just to summarize, yes, I think the Hatra Pradipika was um, produced in a proto Virashaiva milieu. Great, thank you. I should have said that question was from Lucy May, just to make sure everyone gets their credit. Um, the next question we have is from Dominic, um, who says, if I recall, Asidhara is a term from the Upanishads where it refers to the difficulty of getting spiritual discrimination right. Um, history of the term? So that means what's the history of the term? Ah, um, I, that may well be right. And it just means the knife's edge, doesn't it? Um, and it's it's certainly used as a as a, a, a simile or a metaphor elsewhere. And what I what I'll get out of this by not of not knowing the answer by saying that um, Shaman Hatley, who unfortunately was meant to be here around about now, wasn't he? Last week, giving a lecture for us, um, he has written a paper on this called the Asidhara of Rata, actually published in the SOAS Bulletin about three years ago, four years ago. Excellent paper, as ever, by anything by Shaman Hatley is always excellent. So I'm sure that he summarizes the early usage there. In fact, all the 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 te you know, all the, 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 the slide I showed you um, delineating which texts use the term. Uh, I drew that from his his article. I should have credited him there and then. So yeah, if to find out more, um, look there. Great, thank you. Um, and then a question from Anonymous, um, which might be a follow up on Bindu. I think it's just asking for a, a bit more information about Bindu. So what is Bindu? Bindu is semen in the generative organs, but what is it in the head? <laughs> uh, gosh, well, I, you know, I, I can't really answer that, but there's this clearly this idea that it's produced within in the head. I mean, I imagine, I think it's still semen. Yeah, a point I'll make sort of, related to that i suppose it's very closely related to that you'll find you know in certain authors particularly david white um they talk about yogic process you know these processes based on the amrita siddhi because he didn't have access to the amrita siddhi david when he was writing alchemical body and so forth um they talk about the sublimation of semen so they say that the process of of yoga of being able to reverse the, the flows through the central channel actually you know, turns the semen or bindu into something else. We don't find that notion at all within the text, in fact. Um, that seems to be kind of inference from alchemical notions, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, it, it should be applied in this context, certainly not in the text that, that I read. Um, so yeah, the idea I think basically is that it's a you know, gross physical substance that's produced in the head uh, and generally normally drips down uh, not necessarily the central channel. There's two. There's two the Amrita City says there are two downward flowing channels. It can flow down the left channel or the central channel. It's either flowing. There's this sort of you know nourishing liquid in the head. It either flows down the left channel to uh, nourish the body, or and of course we're talking about men here, or it flows down the central channel uh, for purposes of um, procreation, you know, to be ejaculated. Yeah. So I think again to go back to the question what is bindu i think we can say pretty clearly that it is semen great okay um i'm just sending you directly another question um just because i'm not sure i'm going to get the term right um but uh it's have you found any direct discussion of um and it might be chandali i don't know it but also tumo around these practices um i'm looking at six yogas development and connections in indian tantra that's a very interesting question. And I think, and I'm, but I'm really not expert in this idea. And it's something I need to look into. I mean, I'm not, I'm not expert in these Tibetan traditions of Tumo and so forth. I haven't read much about them, but when I do read them, I, I, yeah, thanks actually, this kind of reminded me because I'm finishing off the, you know, the Amrita Siddhi edition, it's basically done. We just got to polish the introduction and the notes a bit. Um, but I did read some material about Chandali and Tumo a while ago. The term Chandali is not used in the Amrita Siddhi, but this process of Tumo seemed to be very close to the, um, to the, the Amrita Siddhi's yoga. 
and closely associated with um yeah i need to look more into this but the, the you know the really nitty gritty part of there's a i think it's chapter 25 or 26 in the amrita siddhi where it talks about the heat that's being generated through the practice and that then needs to be uh, you need to have the yogic control otherwise it will result in ejaculation of bindu but and that seems to be closely re related to my understanding of tumma there's a slight down slight um uh you know a shortcoming of this format is that i'd like to talk to whoever's asked the question and find out or if anyone say if someone has some detail uh, they can send, send me some references to look at because i'm not really sure where the best place to read about tumo is to be honest great thank you um there weren't any other questions that were added um there's still a bit of time if someone wants to fire one in there just before we end um i just wondered if you had any other questions that you're interested in in this in this area any kind of outstanding mysteries um, or anything that you're kind of <laughs> either looking for other people's information on or that you want to focus on in future research um i'm sometimes i, I mean of course i haven't answered all that. Well, well no the big question the big big question that i haven't got an answer for and that become has become apparent to me over the last year or two is why do these practices suddenly appear Okay, why, you know, I used to think, so for example, in my Khetri Vidya book, you know, I argued that, okay, so we've got this Khetri Mudra practice in which the tongue is turned up above the soft palate. And I used to say, well, that's, you know, it's not obviously, but that would be a progression from early references to pressing the tongue against the palate, which we find in the Buddhist Pali Canon and so forth. But now I don't think so. And I think, you know, but I think it is a, it's very much a quantitative difference quantum leap perhaps to get the tongue up into that slot uh, and then if we look at most of the if not all of the other um, distinctive practices of hatha yoga these balancing postures you know postures which can't be held indefinitely these complex methods of pranayama these mudras such as vajroli um, standing on your head um, shakti chalani and so forth they all suddenly appear i mean i say suddenly over over a few centuries about a thousand years ago they seem to appear from nowhere my hunch well i got i've been quite excited looking at the um the amrita siddhi how close the parallels are with uh taoist teachings from china from slightly earlier um yeah i've talked about this before but the you know the kind of physical metaphor in the amrita siddhi is of alchemy and about from about 200 years or more prior to the composition of the Amrita Siddhi we start finding this notion of inner alchemy appearing within Taoist traditions okay so that th those parallels are exciting and there's clearly something going on there's clearly some communication you know some exchange of um, ideas going on but at the same time I don't know where the practices come from so the the practice there don't seem to be any Taoist parallels for these practices of Mahamudra, Mahavanda, Mahaveda. Um, so yes, something is something happens a thousand years ago um, that I I don't know why. I don't know where these practices come from. I don't. Know. I mean, I think that I think there's um, you know there would be scope in terms of a big future research project looking at what's going on in China, what's going on in Tibet, because of Tibet at the same time. We get the emergence of these true core practices, which some people argue may have roots in bone tradition. Uh, I think also in some Islamic traditions, there are, there are people who have argued about this being a, you know, sort of a second axial age. And um, uh, yeah, so I think it, it, it would merit a, a large multidisciplinary uh, project to try to understand what's going on in these different um, traditions and and how their practices and concepts are being are being shared as well. So yeah, but that's a huge question, and whether I will ever get get an answer, well, anyone will get an answer to that. I don't know. Well, it would certainly be interesting to try. So we have one more um, one more question, a quick one uh, from Barbara. Um, do the Myra and Kukuta occur together in Asana lists before the Hatha Pradipika? Um, in the epics, these animals are usually listed together. Are they a common pair in yoga? Oh, that's that's interesting i didn't i didn't know that they yeah as soon as so as I, with the mayura that appears um on its own 
in the Vimaranachana Kalpa around 10th, 11th century. But then I think it's taken up. I can't remember the order exactly. I've written a paper. I've, I've got long footnotes on this in a paper I wrote called Hatha Yoga's Philosophy, which will be on my academia page. And there's footnotes about this there. But yeah, after that, they then appear together all the time. I think they're always found together. Yeah. Um, so that perhaps suggests that the, their, their companionship continues. Well, I mean, I suppose they're, yeah, I suppose they're both birds and they're both thought to, you know, cook, the cuckoo doesn't eat poison, not like the Mayura. But yeah, that's slightly arguing against it is the fact that in the very first instance, it's just Mayura on its own. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll leave, well, one of the final words to um, another question is not a question from Villa, who says, thank you for the great lecture, which um, I would also like to echo, and I'm sure on behalf of everybody else. Um, we'd also be grateful to hear any feedback on this. Um, you can either email us back through Eventbrite or at cys at soas.ac.uk or our other social media channels. Um, and just remain to say thank you very much to Jim and thank you to all of you for joining us.